So a lot of my friends um, asked me what this TED Talk is about. And um, hopefully by the end of it, you'll know what I think learning history is about. And if you don't follow, um, pay attention to the last slide. So, um, um, we are a product of our past. This is a very simple, but I think profound statement made by Rick Warren. Our past can have a big impact, not only on the political structure of our societies, but also on the way we see ourselves and relate to others. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about my past. So I was born um, in Zimbabwe, a country which is famous for Robin Gave and like a, a huge inflation rate. And uh, I, when I was young, I moved to Swaziland, which is a tiny but beautiful kingdom. Um, also famous, but famous for polygamy, absolute monarchy, and a, a really high in, uh, AIDS prevalency rate. Now, a common misconception about Africa is that it's, it's full of Africans. I mean, what it is, but um, not the kinds of Africans which most people think about when they hear the word African. In fact, Africans are a whole mixture of different people of different shapes and sizes, colors and tints, ethnicities and cultures. This, of course, includes um, uh, Europeans and people of European descent, white people, Zoomies, whatever you want to call them. And um, as Africans, we all grow up together. Well, maybe not quite together, but we definitely interact almost on a daily basis with each, with each other. And so I grew up with these people. They were my friends. I mean, there were some differences between us. Um, they had more things. Uh, we they had nicer things. Um, they were the ones who were like the the heroes on TV shows and in cartoons and that kind of thing. Except on Sesame Street, and um, we, this is our version of Sesame Street, it's called Takadani Sesame, and uh, it actually featured the first HIV positive mu Muppet. It was a really good show, I, I loved it. Now, um, the best thing about being uh, a child is that those kinds of differences don't matter. I mean, you have more important things to worry about, like playing and making friends and breaking things. but. Uh, as I, as I grew older, um, these differences started to have more of an impact in my life, uh, especially when I first went abroad for the, very, for the very first time and I gained new titles to my name. So whereas before, my name was just, I was just Beggy. I ended up becoming Beggy, the Swazi guy, Beggy, the African guy, and eventually Beggy, the black guy. And so um, it at this time, it was, like a, it, it was like I was being put on trial, uh, defending where I came from. Everyone, when people got close enough to me, they would come, they would come to me and ask me, "Hey, you Africans, why are you all starving? Why are you all fighting? Why, why are your government so corrupt?" And of course, I would defend myself, try and make them understand that they didn't understand, and that kind of thing. But at the same time, I'd ask myself those same kinds of questions, and I'd be wondering, "Why are we? Why are we always fighting? Why are we poor? Why didn't we go and colonize people? Where, where were you? <laughs> Did we miss the?" We missed a bus or something. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was in this kind of state for a um, couple of years, actually. And um, so I had this weird, conflicted ambivalence towards home, where I came from. I mean, I loved it, but, you know, I was like, oh, what were we doing? Um, so th this uh, state carried on like this uh, until, actually, I came here for the first time um, and took my first history class in six years. And um, it was a survey class on the history of Africa. It was like the whole hit of Africa, which is kind of weird. But um, and so the only reason I was in that class was because I didn't get an English class, which I wanted. And so <laughs> I didn't really have many great expectations for the class. And at the beginning, I wasn't disappointed. We were learning about pottery and Stone Age people. I couldn't really keep a waking class for the first few lessons. Um, but as we got more <laughs> into the material, and we started learning about things like the relationship between Egypt and Nubia, and that's a a Nubian pharaoh, and uh, we learned about the, the wars between the Kosa and the Boer, and we learned about Mansa Musa, the, the richest person in the history of man, and those kinds of things. Um, I started to get more interested in the class, and I started to really delve more into the material. And the further we went in the class, I started um, recalling things which I had experienced, which were to do with the history of Africa, things which I which I saw, ideas, people, that kind of thing. So, and we also, we also d um, talked about like the contentious nature of words such as, as tribe and civilization and African. And so it, it got me really thinking about these things. 
So I would be thinking about Reverend uh, James David Manning, who is uh, who leads a congregation in Harlem, and he preaches self-loathing amongst the black community. I'll think about Ian Smith, who was the leader of, of Rhodesia, and who and whose bush role my father was in, my grandfather was imprisoned for five years. Think about people like Nelson Mandela, people like Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara, and I'll think of ideas such as child soldiers and war and apartheid and poverty and and the UN and the AU and even slavery. And so all these things were in my mind all the time as we went through this class. And I and I just kept trying to grapple and deal with these ideas. But the one thing which I really thought about the most was a conversation I had with a friend of mine. That's him. Um, <laughs> I didn't get permission for his picture, so um, we're just going to call him T right now. And so uh, T and I were walking, um, we were going together to go play basketball. And as we, as we were on our way walking, um, we passed this poll which, which had a headline about a, a company which had just been privatized and there was some scandal going on with me. So T just looks at me and shakes his head and, and he says, give anything to black people, they're going to ruin it. And so that was just an, another instance of um, the typical half-joking self-deprecation we, we engage in at home. But it was also, to me, it was... Uh, characteristic of an endemic feeling of um, inferiority which we experience at home. So kind of that kind of feeling, it's, it's there in our lives. It's not overt. We don't really talk about it, but it's there. And um, we saw it. Oops. Sorry. We, we, we think about it. We don't really think about it and we don't really talk about it, but we saw it. Like when, we, when you'd watch a benefit concert for Africa or you'd listen to it on a heal Heal the World song, or on, on our televisions, uh, yes, televisions, in, um, <laughs> on UN campaigns, and that kind of thing. And so our shame was being broadcast to us as we grew up constantly everywhere we went. And it's something which, which is eventually raised a generation of inferiority complexes. Whenever you meet someone, you think, yes, I'm an African. We are poor. We are the ones who are starving. And we are in that kind of situation. Even if you look at Africanists and African apologists, their apologies come from the standpoint of inferiority. They'll be quick to try and claim the Egyptian pyramids as part of black Africa or try and show you pictures of like downtown Nairobi or um, another big city like that. And this was a step in the wrong direction really for me because all it did was first of all homogenize us as if we were all the same. And it, would, it also denied our self-determination as well as denying our uniqueness and holding us to a standard, an outside standard of what is civilized, what is developed. And so with that, you can see that history can hurt, but it can also empower. So this is a quote from the American Historical Association. It says, history should be studied because it is essential to individuals and to society and because it harbors beauty. Now, I believe the reason it didn't harbor beauty for me and my friend T is because of the way our history has been given to us. Um, most people back home, so at least in Swaziland, don't really study history. And those that do never study pre-colonial history. So where do we get our history from? From the concerts, from the TV, from the campaigns. And that's where we get, get our identity. And so what happens is that we get our history as short and simple. And so what do I mean by short? Anyone who has not studied African history if you'd ask them, what do you think we were doing? What was happening on the continent before that first Portuguese ship landed on the continent? A lot of people would, would imagine these kind of tribal types just kind of like chasing around food and looking for berries and that kind of, that kind of thing. And really, that's disregarding thousands of years of rich and illustrious history. And the same thing with, with, um, with it being um, simple. A lot of people, people outside of academia, people love to simplify things. So we find ourselves being simplified as either warring or starving people, or as victims or agents in tragedy, or as either primitive tribal or developing people. And so the combination of these two things, focusing on only on recent history and simplifying our history, has left a, a generation of hopeless, of hopelessness. And I believe studying a better study of history can actually change this. But if, if we make the short long and the simple complex, 
we can gain a wider perspective of ourselves in order, in order so we can redefine ourselves. And, oh, excuse me. Yes. So if I can learn from, if I can learn about the Zimbas at Great Zimbabwe, magnificent stone buildings, characteristic of a, of a uh, centralized economy, and then uh, of a centralized society, then I can uh, no longer believe it when someone tells me there was nothing which was built in Africa before people came over. If I can, if I can learn about Mansa Musa and the Trans-Saharan uh, trans trade, I cannot believe that, um, th that I cannot see a people who were sitting there undeveloped and waiting for enlightenment from overseas and who had no control over their own destiny. In the same way, if I learn about um, Asante, the kingdoms of Asante, Dahomey, and, and Benin, and their relationship to the slave trade and how they benefited from the slave trade as well as how they tried to stop it, then I cannot see Africans as, purely, as either purely victims or agents in the slave trade. So I think a better, s a better understanding of history will help us escape from this box of simple and short. A better, uh, a better understanding of history will help us reconceptualize our identity and make it our own for the future. And so what I'm, I'm not saying that we should ignore our past failures and make excuses for our present ones. Or I'm, not, I'm also not saying we should romanticize the good things which happened in the past and try and relive that. Instead, I'm talking about taking responsibility for our present and our future by recognizing our, p our potential, our worthiness, and our ability to do something for ourselves. And I mean, I don't think studying history is like, uh, is like a miracle cure which will suddenly change everything. But it's a start and a way to make people believe in themselves. And that's how you, that's how you make change, when you believe you can make change. So, and uh, no matter how many telethons you do, how many campaigns, interventions, only an empowered people can develop themselves. And so for that important last slide, I believe that studying history is about cultivating a sense of self-worth so we may better develop our future selves.